a call to worship this morning based on the words from the Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd. We whose journeys are always beginning, we whose mission always awaits us, we whose visions are bent on loving, we gather here. We gather as community drawn together out of common need. We gather together with questions, the kinds of questions that have no easy answers. We gather with hope that pulses on through untold suffering. We gather with tenderness for one another that can only be known from knowing human blessings and human failings. Our grief is holy ground. And so we gather on this holy ground, thirsting and hungry for meaning, drawn to the source of all weeping, all devotion, and all grace. In this quiet time, may we who are hungry and sorrowful find nourishment and rest. Very good morning to you. Welcome to the First Unitarian Universalist Church of San Diego. I'm the Reverend Omega Burkhart, and my pronouns are she, they, and ella in Espanol. Good morning. My name is Cora Pendergast, and my pronouns are she, her, and they. I'm this year's president of our new board of trustees. We had our first meeting last Tuesday, and we're really looking forward to the new church year and to working with Reverend Omega, our new minister, Reverend Justine Sullivan, and all of you, the entire congregation, on accomplishing our church goals. It, it will take all of us, and I think we're going to have a great year. We extend a welcome to those who join us on the patio at Hillcrest. And for those of you in other places and times, thank you for tuning in online today. We're always glad to have you here virtually with us. And a very special wel welcome, excuse me, for those who may be here for the first time or the first time in a long time. Our community is a vital, diverse, and multi-generational congregation without borders, with a mission to create community, nurture spiritual growth, and act on our values to help heal the world. Es un placer para mí estar aquí con Cora Pendergrass, que es la nueva presidenta de la Junta Directiva de la Iglesia, que están en el proceso de comenzar un año nuevo aquí, un año lleno de posibilidades. Eh, yo voy a estar aquí durante todo el año con la nueva reverenda Justine Sullivan, que va a acompañarnos eh, empezando en agosto, en, en unas semanas. Muy bienvenidos a todos ustedes que están aquí no, con nosotros hoy en el campus de Hillcrest o aquí adentro o ahí afuera en el patio. Hola a todos en el patio. Bienvenidos a todos que están con nuestra comunidad virtualmente y un bienvenido es muy especial a todos ustedes que están con nosotros por primera vez. Nuestra comunidad es una congregación vital, diversa y multigeneracional, sin fronteras, cuya misión es crear comunidad, fomentar el crecimiento espiritual y vivir nuestros valores para ayudar a sanar el mundo. We are a congregation made up of people of different racialized identities and cultures, people of various sexual orientations and gender identities, people with a variety of physical and mental abilities. We are creators of community and compassion, and though we can fall short, we're committed to practicing and affirming welcome to all. Somos una congregación compuesta de personas de distintas identidades racializadas y culturas, personas de diversas orientaciones sexuales e identidades de género, personas de varias habilidades mentales y físicas. Somos creadores de comunidad y compasión. Y aunque a veces nos quedamos cortos, estamos comprometidos a dar la bienvenida a todos. In a spirit of reverence, we acknowledge that we gather this morning to reflect, sing, learn, and converse on the stolen land of the Kumeye, who continue to pray, sing, gather, and live throughout their territories. As we journey together, may we hold the Kumeye in our hearts and minds. Con espíritu de reverencia, reconocemos que nos juntamos esta mañana 
para meditar, cantar, aprender y conversar en la tierra arrebatada de los Kumiai, quienes continúan reuniéndose, cantando, orando y viviendo en todo su territorio. Al emprender este viaje juntos, mantengamos en nuestros corazones y mentes el pueblo Kumiai. Let us join our spirits in our church hymn and recite our church aspiration. Unámonos a nuestros espíritus en el himno de nuestra iglesia y digamos nuestra aspiración. Please rise in body or spirit. church. May the quest for truth be its sacrament and service be its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, and to help one another in fellowship. This is our aspiration. Que el amor sea la doctrina de esta iglesia, la búsqueda de la verdad, su sacramento, y el servicio, su oración. Vivir juntos en paz Buscar la verdad con libertad y ayudarnos mutuamente en comunidad. A eso aspiramos. Today we gather to celebrate and honor endings so that you may make space for hope in your hearts. We can only do this in community, and so I'm inviting you to sing with us the hymn, Comfort Me. If you would like to stand and sway, you are more than welcome. If you would like to remain seated, that's fine too. Comfort Me, hymn 1002. Comfort me, comfort me.
Good morning, friends. My name is Tony. I use he, him pronouns, and I would like to invite any children who would like to come forward for our Time for All Ages to come on down. And if you're coming down, we're going to sit on this side. No? No takers? All right. All by myself on the floor. That's okay. Can't hear me? Is that better? There we go. Oh, look at that. A round of applause. So today, we are thinking about endings. And as I thought about this from the perspective of some of our younger friends, it occurred to me that perhaps one of the most common endings they experience happens on the first day of school. It's on that day that a person's life changes dramatically. It might be the first time they were separated from parents or daily caregivers. They shift suddenly from being, in many cases, the focus of individual attention to being one among many in a classroom, to say nothing of all the new people, personalities, and routines that they encounter for the first time. So with that in mind, I chose as our story for today, the pigeon has to go to school. Wait! Don't read that title! <laughs> Too late. Rats. Why do I have to go to school? I already know everything. Go on, ask me a question. Any question. Well... Maybe I know almost everything. Does school start in the morning? Because you know what I'm like in the morning. It is not pretty. I wish I was a little chick again. A little itty bitty, not going to school, baby wavy pigeon. What if I don't like school? What if I really don't like it? What if I really, really don't like it? What if, what if the teacher doesn't like pigeons? And the stuff, what about all the stuff? There is so much stuff to learn. What if I learn too much? My head might pop off. I'm scared. What will happen at school? What if there is math? What, why does the alphabet have so many letters? Reading can be hard with one big eye. What about lunch? What will the other birds think of me? Will finger paint stick to my feathers? The unknown stresses me out, dude. There should be a place to practice those things with experts to help you, and books, and classrooms, and other birds to work and play with, maybe a playground. Oh, that is school. Well, how am I supposed to get there anyway? What? <laughs> Step aside, coming through. The pigeon has to go to school. The end. So I hope you enjoyed the story, and I also hope you see how it can be a parable for us as we return to being in a somewhat familiar and in other ways very different way of being a church community. Just like the pigeon, I hope that we can find a way to let this be an experience of learning and growth with friends and experts around us to nurture us along the way. And I will invite my friends up here to join me as we stand up and say our affirmation. We'll say it first in Spanish and then in English. And I've been told I can only use one hand because I need the microphone for the online people. Are we ready? We are Unitarian Universalists a people of open minds, loving hearts, and welcoming hands. Somos unitarios universalistas, personas de mentes abiertas,
corazones amorosos y manos que dan la bienvenida. And I invite all of our children to meet us outside near the ramp for religious education. Thank you so much, Tony, and for the kiddos who helped us with that, just great. Before we move into our generosity offering, I have a few announcements for you. We are looking for worship leaders for the church year, for the 2022-2023 church year, both here and in South Bay. If you are interested, if you'd like to know more information, please contact me. Uh, you can talk to me after service, or you can write me an email, omega at firstuusandiego.org. Also, join us for the summer hoot nanny in your orders of service. You probably saw this yellow sheet right here. This is presented by Front Street Productions, the UU Men's Fellowship and the Outreach and Growth Fund. Our summer hoot nanny will feature various musicians from our community, including the Jewel Tones. Do we have any Jewel Tones here? A jewel, a jewel tone, <laughs> perfect. We will also have uh, Carolyn and Tom Owentol, who will participate, Drew Massacott, the South Bay Singers, the Front Street Troubadours, ooh, yeah, and more, and more, but wait, there's more. Emceed by Marshall Voigt and with some snacks and ice cream popsicles for everyone. This event is for the whole entire family. So join us on Saturday the 30th at 4 p.m. for the Summer Hoot Nanny. I'm told it's going to be a hoot. And now for our offering. La ofrenda de generosidad este mes se destinará durante el mes de julio a Volunteer Conceli, una organización con la misión de conectar voluntarios de la comunidad LGBTQ+, más, con oportunidades de servicio en la comunidad. This month's generos generosity offering will go to Volunteer with Chelly, an organization with the mission of connecting our LGBTQ plus community and their allies with opportunities for service in the region. We are extremely glad to participate with this organization throughout this month. We'll watch a short video and then afterwards I'll tell you how you can donate. Welcome to Volunteer with Telly, where we work to inspire, engage, and empower the LGBTQ plus community. Voluntariado con Chali es un movimiento creado por voluntarios para voluntarios, creado en 2013 y ayudando a más de 35 organizaciones y eventos alrededor del condado de San Diego y Riverside, así dándote la oportunidad de crear conciencia de la comunidad LGBTQ y más. La meta es crear conciencia y un puente entre la comunidad LGBTQ+, y nuestras alianzas. If you're looking to meet new people, if you're looking to volunteer, or become part of our family, please visit volunteerwithchelly.org. We hope to volunteer with you soon, and for now, adios! I just want to remind everyone that one of our goals here at First Unitarian Universalist Church of San Diego is to take the lead from our organizations in the region and in the city who are working with, led by, or serve primarily communities who have previously been marginalized. So we are thrilled to work with Volunteer Concelli, Volunteering with Chelly, because of that partnership. We take the lead from her organization. Some of you got to meet her a few weeks ago, and we're very proud of that. So thank you very much. Puede donar aquí en el sitio web de nuestra iglesia, firstuusandiego.org. Donations también puede donar aquí con efectivo si quieren, o cheque o tarjeta usando las cestas que están aquí o los frascos. Y como siempre, muchas gracias por su generosidad. You may donate by using the dip jars and the baskets that are located in the middle of the meeting house. You may also donate online always at firstuusandiego.org slash donations. Thank you, as always, for your generosity.
For today's reading, I have selected a poem from Billy Collins entitled Aristotle. It's a poem in three parts. The first part. This is the beginning. Almost anything can happen. This is where you find the creation of light, a fish wriggling onto land, the first word of paradise lost on an empty page. Think of an egg or the letter A. A woman ironing on a bare stage as the heavy curtain rises. This is the very beginning. The first person narrator introduces himself, tells us about his lineage. The mezzo-soprano stands in the wings. Here, the climbers are studying a map or pulling on their long woolen socks. This is early on, years before the ark dawn. The profile of an animal is being smeared on the wall of a cave. And you have not yet learned to crawl. This is the opening, the gambit, a pawn moving forward an inch. This is your first night with her, or your first night without her. This is the first part where the wheels begin to turn, where the elevator begins its ascent before the doors lurch open. This is the middle. Things have had time to get complicated, messy, really. Nothing is simple anymore. Cities have sprouted up along the rivers, teeming with people at cross purposes. A million schemes, a million wild looks. Disappointment unshoulders his knapsack here and pitches his ragged tent. This is the sticky part where the plot congeals where the action suddenly reverses or swerves off in an outrageous direction. Here, the narrator devotes a long paragraph to why Miriam does not want Edward's child. Someone hides a letter under a pillow. Here, the aria rises to a pitch, a song of betrayal salted with revenge. And the climbing party is stuck on a ledge halfway up the mountain. This is the bridge, the painful modulation. This is the thick of things. So much is crowded into the middle. The guitars of Spain and piles of ripe avocados and Russian uniforms and noisy parties and lakeside kisses and arguments heard through a wall. Too much to name, too much to think about. And this is the end, the car running out of road, the river losing its name in the ocean, the long nose of the photographed horse touching the white electronic line. This is the colophon, the last elephant in the parade, the empty wheelchair and pigeons floating down in the evening. Here the stage is littered with bodies. The narrator leads all of the characters to their cells and the climbers are in their graves. It is me hitting the period and you closing the book. It is Sylvia Plath in the kitchen and Saint Clement with an anchor around his neck. This is the final bit, thinning away to nothing. This is the end, according to Aristotle, what we have all been waiting for, what everything comes down to, the destination we cannot help imagining, a streak of light in the sky, a hat on a peg, 
and outside, outside the cabin, falling leaves. Join me in a spirit of prayer. Spirit of life and love, you who move within us, among us, and beyond us, help us to respond to our outrage with commitment instead of fear. Help us to come out of our sorrow with renewed strength. Help us to make of this broken world a place of purpose and faithfulness and dedication. Spirit of love, meet with us on this path. Meet with us in our brokenness and guide us toward a place of peace. May it be so. Guess he sail. Amen. Let us remain seated as we sing the special music, I Know I Can. You are invited to sing along or to hum along or simply listen. Yes. 
so neighbors take my hand and children sing my song when hope awaits at every turn I know we Well, it happened. I saw school supplies out the other day when I went to Target. Much to my surprise, I know it may be two-thirds the way through July, but my internal calendar, the one I've worked so hard to cultivate here in San Diego, has seemed to set itself on uh, always summertime, so I had forgotten that school was right around the corner which is very interesting to me because when I lived in the upper Midwest, especially as a mom to two school-age kids, the end of July meant that special time of school preparation for the tradition in August known as drop-off day at their school. When we got to visit their new classrooms and leave our donated rolls of paper towels and reams of photocopy paper and stacks of three-ring binders and new pencils, and markers and gym shoes and all sorts of other assorted items that would set them and their teachers off on a course of well-supplied learning for the new school year. And it is highly possible that I got more excited about shopping for school supplies than my children. I mean, who amongst us doesn't love a new journal? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. It is a curious mix of excitement and nostalgia, though. Braced for the new and different, the school years of our youth offer us those tangible time stamps, those markers that help orient us. Quite literally, a turning of the calendar comes to mark change of new new development and cycles of growth, new relationships, and also the leaving behind, the leaving behind of rituals that brought us comfort, that brought us joy. How many of you remember fondly the days of recess and mandated nap time? Mm. And how many of you now, at this point of your lives, when you're thinking about it, you can't remember exactly when that changed, but you know that it did. You know that it did. With change comes loss. It, loss is more often in the day-to-day -day moments of our lives. It goes unrecognized. It goes unnoticed. We don't have an opportunity to mark those losses. I wish that there had been a ritual of no more nap time. There are other times in our lives, though, when we are better at marking change and the inherent hope and grief that comes with loss. Perhaps nowhere in our lives is this more evident than the rituals that we have around the end of our lives. These rituals where we wrap questions of ultimacy and purpose with the warm embrace of our beloveds, family members, chosen and biological, who gather at our bedsides, the life reviews we engage in with our life partners and our mentors and our pastors, our spiritual guides, and the celebration of our lives that we make on our departure from this physical plane. If you were present with us last week, either here in person or online, you heard Reverend Katie speak about finding purpose in helping people through these difficult moments of our lives. 
Her work as a chaplain is her life's purpose. That work centers accompanying those in both the healing journey and the loss at the end stages of life. While she was giving her sermon, I reflected on my own experience while working as an intern chaplain. I remembered one day in particular, I stood in the hallway of one of the hospitals where I was working. My finger paused mid-air on its way to hit the up button for the elevator. The first few bars of twinkle, twinkle, little star played over the hospital sound system, signaling that a baby had just been born on the floor above me in labor and delivery. I paused. I closed my eyes and I took a deep breath. And in an instant, all of the thoughts of being a new parent flooded back to me, the joy and the wonder, but also the worry and the anxiety. I'm sure that the reason why that moment was also so poignant, I can still remember it so clearly, was due in part to what I had been doing earlier that day. You see, folks who wind up in the hospital and request a chaplain rarely do so because they want to share good news. And while true, I had been blessed with the opportunity to share in recoveries and discharges and the birth of children, I most often accompanied patients and families in their toughest times. That day earlier, I had met with a family making choices about the long-term treatment for their father who was suffering late-stage dementia. I'd also met with a couple struggling with the news about the wife and mother who was 35 and had been told she would not be going home because of the cancer ravaging her body. I sat with patients and brought them comfort just through presence, meditation, maybe prayer. I witnessed the death rattle of the last breath and I also stood solemnly at attention during a patient's honor walk, a tradition reserved for those whose donated organs save someone else's life. And yet, that day, on the floor above me was new life. New life, an elevator ride away. We cannot hope to love all that is new in this world without also honoring, grieving that which has passed. We must grieve the losses that change presents for us. For without marking that loss, we risk feeling incomplete. Always a sensation of not having closure. We have to be able to acknowledge that sometimes endings bring pain and we have to do that together because the underpinnings of our theology, of the interconnection for all, all of this, means we have to make new together. In other words, our liberal faith tradition compels us to hold both the grief of loss and the hope for the future at the same time. It hasn't always been this way, and in many aspects of our Unitarian Universalist spaces, this one included, as well as the larger white Protestant religious world, and in fact, many of our cultural contexts, not all, but many of them, we have been taught, or perhaps our systems have been constructed to teach us, that might be a better phrase, that there is limitless possibility based on a linear progression, or as the Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd phrases it, a belief, and I quote, in the world to come, 
a world that we could build with our own hands. She terms this a progressive hopefulness based on a generally upward trajectory of history. This is based on the idea that it carries with it a tendency towards some sort of triumphalism in our understanding of time, history, and human potential. She goes on to say, and I quote, the story we were told indicated that things were pointing in the right direction and that we, she is a white Unitarian Universalist minister, she says we, and I also am, so I will adopt that we. We, the mostly white, highly educated, and politically progressive religious liberals of our era, were surely the very ones to serve as our nation's moral compass, situating all others towards true north. My question is, if that's the case, what happens, what do we do when it all falls apart? When it all falls apart, as it has over the past several years, when it all falls apart, when what we held so dear, that what held us so dearly, when it's gone, when some of us realize that there has never been that surety of purpose in life, the dignity, the basic human rights that others have taken for granted, what do we do? What do we do when those of us who have known that pain has been normal for ourselves, pain has been normal for our families, it has never existed for us and we have to painfully endure the awakening of others to these cold, hard truths? What do we do? What do we do when our systems that hold us, our communities that hold us, our families, our church communities, aren't able to gather in the way that once sustained us? What do we do? Perhaps an answer can be found into in what Duke religious professor Joseph R. Winters terms as a different kind of hope. Reverend McDonald Ladd engages with this philosophy. It is a truth telling of history as experienced by marginalized people that offers a way forward. Professor Winters writes that in the black literary and aesthetic traditions, just like in their counterparts of the Central American liberation theologies, in those traditions, they consider that truth is based on the experience of marginalized people, and it's not based on narratives of middle class comfort and respectability. Reverend Ladd describes it this way, a better world, and I'm quoting her, a better world depends on our ability to intentionally encounter suffering without seeking to minimize or distract from the particular in, in, excuse me, intensity of the authentic narrative being shared. That's chaplain work. That's chaplain work, to intentionally encounter suffering without seeking to minimize or distract from the particular intensity of the authentic narrative being shared. Hope, she states, hope is not just another version of optimism. Optimism tells a preordained narrative. It is an assertion, optimism is an assertion that the scales have already been tipped toward triumph. Optimism is always busy absolving somebody. Hope is different. Like faith, hope is the exact opposite of certainty. It does not require ease. It does not require naivete. Hope is real. It is tangible and it is enduring. Even after the good news, even after the good news has all been declared, even when the authentic stories of our lives do not have fairy tale happy beginnings, middles, or ends. Ah.
I have hope. I have hope, not just optimism. Optimism would require a certainty and a particular kind of outcome. But I have hope. Like many of my Gen X counterparts, I have hope that our institutions, our political institutions, healthcare, education, I have hope that those institutions can someday live up to the potential that I want them to have that I was formed to think they have, but they don't. And I'm not certain they can in the way that they are right now. Maybe it's time for some of the always been done this way to stop being done this way. As your minister, I have hope. I have hope for our congregation as we navigate our way back into a new way of doing church. But I don't have optimism because that would demand certainty that we know what new church looks like. And the fact is, we don't. Our growing understanding of how we need to tend to the work of the world, to human rights and social justice, to inclusivity, to the reality that the people of the world's majority are not, in fact, represented in these walls, this growing awareness, awareness in how we do church demands that we change. The pandemic, as terrible as it was and continues to be, and the adaptations that this community, this church has had to make, and I mean the folks in this room, our buildings, and our wider community. These changes offer us a marker, a turning of the calendar, an opportunity for new encounters, new ways of caring for one another, for new rituals. We know that some of the ways of doing things just can't continue the way they were before. Maybe committees can't work in the same way, and we know that worship won't be the same. And that's okay. We can mourn that and celebrate the possibility of change. We have a new board of trustees. Cora was with us earlier. We have a new board of trustees with a set of clearly defined goals that you, the members of this congregation, helped define and you will help bring into the world. In a few weeks, our new lead developmental minister, the Reverend Justine Sullivan, will arrive and I'm thrilled to share in, in the work of ushering in a new era of congregational self-reflection and new renewed covenantal relationship. In other words, we should have hope and we should cultivate it within ourselves and each other, but not at the expense or in place of grieving that change has taken place and will continue to take place. This month's theme for worship and in small group discussions at both campuses, Hillcrest and South Bay, has been the good, the bad, and the ugly, and probably by now you have realized we're not talking about Clint Eastwood. Perhaps you attended the service that opened this month with Reverend Arved about why we need to hear about evil or Reverend Katie's sermon last week about finding purpose in her life in being a chaplain and how honoring complexities of balancing wellness and spiritual care with grief and hope bring meaning to her life. And sandwiched between those two sermons was a joyous celebration of pride, but that joy was tinged with the recognition that we have to combat shame, that we have to combat control over our bodies. And next week, 
we will hold a service here at the Hillcrest campus dedicated to reproductive justice. It will be a service of grief and lament and anger at the eroding of basic human rights to health care. A service of reigniting a fight that many of us didn't think we would have to face again in our lifetimes. We have to acknowledge the difficulties we are currently presented with and ground ourselves into the process, the process of making it better, not just the preordained outcome of what will be, because there's no certainty of that. There's no certainty of that. But the process is in the hope. The process of hope resides in the ways we tend to the lives and the spirits of those around us. Because hope is messy. We need to tend to it in ourselves and by cultivating beloved community. The act of cultivating it, not the destination. Hope is getting it wrong sometimes, but also coming back together in love and in covenant and also in honoring what can no longer be. So let us not give in to false optimism. An optimism that's based on certainty that we know what the answer will be. No. Let us grieve our losses and attend to our own and to each other's pain. For that is how we form the relationships that keep estrangement at bay. We need to be together to keep estrangement at bay. Let us honor the end of some things that we have held dearly so that we may make space for hope. Let us be chaplains to hope, a hope that finds poignant joy in the turning of the seasons, the celebration of summer, and the upcoming fall, because hope is like a new journal, not knowing how it will be filled. May it be so. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we sing, keep on moving forward, vamos todos adelante. Gonna keep on moving forward, keep on moving forward, keep on moving forward, never turning back, never turning back, vamos todos adelante. extinguishing of the chalice. From the Reverend M. Barclay, nothing much of value grows quickly. 
not courage, not healing, not love that liberates, not justice that transform, not the new world we hope to grow from the ruins of all that has been destroyed. Everything we need the most for our collective soul to make it through this alive requires great urgency and abundant patience. Let us go from this place today as chaplains of chains, chaplains of hope, tending to the hearts of our community, united. Blessed be. Que así sea. Amen. Thank you.